of the forum this year. This year, the theme revolves around the role of architects in the evolving context of intertwined complexities of human non-human, architect client, privileged marginalized binaries that have inherently influenced the practice and discourse of architecture. This year, the forum triggers questions of how some of these binaries are now becoming more diffuse, leading to a necessity to reassess architecture and how it is practiced. The shortlisted projects identify a set of design approaches that represent a diversity in their roles and stances as an architect, school of thought, modes of representation, and acts as catalysts for a multifaceted and enriching discussion. Before we start, it is very important to be cognizant of the fact that the forum is being held online for the second time due to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is on all of us to acknowledge that and be perceptive of the changes and challenges we have all faced in the last 18 months and are continually grateful to all the participants and students who have taken out the time to contribute to this forum. With this, we begin our second curated discussion, probing processes, understanding interdependencies. Each project operates within a web of interdependencies, following an idiosyncratic process born out of various influences. These influences lead to an evolution of stance in both the project and the agency of an architect and brings forth the various systems of thinking. Dissecting these processes involved pushes us to scrutinize around the comparison between the intentions of the program web and the results in the design web and the negotiations and interdependencies that come into play. Our moderators for the day are Vishwanath Kashikar and Rahul Chandra Shekhar. Vishwanath Kashikar is our prof professor at the Faculty of Architecture, SEPT University. His main area of interest is urban housing and he conducted, uh, and he has conducted and guided several research projects related to housing. His current areas of interest include the idea of domesticity in the Indian context and the impact of flexibility in urban housing design. Rahul is a fresh graduate and currently aspires to establish his own practice in the profession. He identifies himself as an archetypical architect with his love for designing and building. His theoretical interests primarily lie in design thinking and strategies for design. Currently, Rahul resides and works in Chennai. To also introduce our presenters for today, Madhuli, Devash, Deep, and Jay. Madhuli Avasakar is an architect from Nasik who graduated from IES College of Architecture, Mumbai in 2020. She will be presenting her project on the Silk Udyog unifying silk and its people, which talks about the cultural heritage value of silk, the conflicts faced, the transition that handloom weavers experienced, and how architecture could be a catalyst in the response to this. Deva Shet has pursued architecture from the School of Environment and Architecture, Mumbai. He will be presenting his project on inhabiting the in-betweens, which argues through drawing that the intense human neighborhood can be seen through a lens of sensorium and form a sense landscape for an animal. Jay Kapadia is a recent graduate of the Faculty of Architecture, Sket Surat, and through his project, Participatory Housing Approach for Conservation Induced Displacement, the case of city community in Uttar Kannada, Karnataka, intends to initiate the role of user participation in the research and design process in designing neighborhoods. Deep is a recent graduate from the Faculty of Architecture, Marwadi University, Rajkot, and his project, Reconnecting with the Past, National Maritime Museum at Lothal, proposes a museum that showcases Lothal's culture along with its maritime history. A huge thank you for all for joining us today. To give a brief in introduction for our respondents, Mr. Ranjit Hoskote, who has been acclaimed as a seminal contributor to Indian art criticism and curatorial practice and is a leading Indian poet, he is the author of more than 30 books, including Vanishing Acts, 
new and selected poems and central time. His current design research projects considers agencies across various scales and geographies with ongoing investigations into the homologies between scientific ecology markets, urban informal informality, and food. Ms. Herringer, who will be joining us shortly, is an architect and an honorary professor of the UNESCO Chair of Urban Architecture, Building Cultures, and Sustainable Development. She focuses on the use of natural building materials and has been actively involved in development cooperation in Bangladesh since 1997. Her diploma work, the Meti School in Rudrapur, won the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2007. Unfortunately, due to health issues, Ms. Schneider, who was the third panelist for today's session, won't be joining us today. Um, We will wait for a few minutes for Ms. Anna Herringer. Um, sorry for the delay, everybody. Um, all right, so to give a quick brief outline of the session, the first half of today's session will be presentations by the four presenters for eight to 10 minutes each and two minutes break in between to clarify any doubts or raise any key points. I would request everyone to abide by the time limits. There would be a warning bell at five minutes and one more at nine minutes. The discussion will then be driven by the moderators and the panelists. We encourage the audience to post their curiosities and questions in the Q&A chat box, and we will take them up at the end of the discussion, and we will invite them to switch on their videos and be a part of the discussion. Interested participants and attendee attendees can also request to join the discussion in the chat box. So without further ado, I would invite our first panelist, Madhuli, to start sharing our uh, sharing her presentation. Thank you, Heat. Hello.
good evening everyone so the topic for my design dissertation is silk sayug unifying silk and its people so basically the topic began from my personal inclination for textiles as well as silk which further translated into a topic for thesis the entire process from sericulture to its weaving involves converting the cycle of silk worm into a thread and further into a magnificent fabric it is a accumulation of multiple processes first mulberry plantation second silk worm rearing third cocoon formation fourth reeling fifth dyeing and sixth weaving there were multiple events and people in the history of silk that influenced its timeline as well as nature two prominent processes that is sericulture and weaving had two respective timelines weaving being the oldest practiced experienced a spectrum of influences in terms of politics culture and society sericulture was much later development established by east india company hence silk timeline is an intersection of diverse events that has shaped its presence present as well as interdependencies in it talking about the strong influences that it has had first political royal uh, facilitated silk and established on indian map east india company and tipu sultan further established a sericulture in west bengal as well as mysore indian independence led to establishment of central silk road second cultural decline of handloom practice various uh, initiatives by royal families as well as the wider use social use of silk as currency further the broken legacy as well as the further dynamic apparel as well as fashion trends natural bacteria outbreak led to decline in sericulture all over india except mysore scientific experiments that led to stronger species of mulberry and drought conditions in maharashtra economic silk route route and entry of silk in india industrial revolution less exposure towards sericulture as well as increase in taxes moving on to the detailed silk process the first step includes uh, that is sericulture includes mulberry plantation silk worm rearing as well as cocoon formation second is cocoon auctioning which includes registration cocoon testing as well as the auction process reeling involves sorting of cocoons drying them stiffening boiling reeling them vacuuming the thread and further drying dyeing involves degumming the silk yarn dyeing the yarn twisting and drying it and the last process is the weaving process wherein the thread is further spent uh, the design is done as well as the uh, fabric is weaved in the end the process involves layers of agencies workers mechanisms places tools structures hence the interdependencies are a matrix of various relationships that are largely classified as people process system and resources these interdependencies are scattered in nature and are incomplete in a sense many processes are largely dependent on external factors that act as a missing link between various issues in every sub process is contributed to the larger concern issues like dependency on mysore silk board lack of knowledge to set up farms lack of infrastructure lack of cocoon markets facilities resources space trainings decreasing number of handloom weavers market network etc these these concerns and interdependencies led to the program development talking about the intentions of program unifying the scattered activities equip empower weavers farmers through trainings and support provide resources infrastructure to people and process establish a link between system and people decrease dependency on other states and increase interdependencies within process of maharashtra bridge the gap between people resources and market focusing on the scenario in maharashtra vidarbha is one of the most active areas in terms of sericulture due to less rainfall drought conditions sericulture is a lucrative option to agriculture selected site is a plot of existing sericulture department it is situated near rambagiri lake surrounded with other institutes like vnit power training center etc 
the site consists of a department of sericulture internal road the plot that is owned by uh, the existing department is approx 38000 square meters of which 11000 was selected to design the intervention and the rest is the plantation of mulberries tussar and other species the department of sericulture offers certain facilities in addition to them the program expands the existing scope the design consists of four phases as follows the experiential phase which includes self process textile exhibit and conferences second institutional phase third administrative body with research and development expansion fourth the accommodation facility for trainees the planning was in response to the existing site and features administrative space was planned near existing sericulture department to maintain a sink experiential and training space was planned along plantation to maintain the flow of activities as well as experience and the inter intersection of these two is a public space which is used for cafe seating exhibit etc plants the multifunctional central spine was a con conscious design step that not only helped the movement but also allowed the primary functions to expand established a virtual, visual drama between spaces across the project started with an intention to know more about silk as a lifestyle as well as a process understanding the influences and interdependencies further allowed to translate the concerns into a response the role of an architect in this is of a catalyst that ties the four processes or the four major factors that is people resources process and system together and accelerates the process that for a long time required an agent to tie everything together this platform increases interdependencies and bridges the gap between them thank you thank you madhuri if anybody has any questions or uh, um, doubts to clear all right if no then uh, i now invite devash to share their screen Hi, uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Hello all. I am Deva Shet, and I have recently graduated from C School of Environment and Architecture, Mumbai. My research dissertation is titled "Sense Landscape of an Animal in an Intense Human Habitation," and my design is titled as "Inhabiting of the In Betweens." I would like to take you all through my research. the The objective of the research was. the objective of the research was to understand what is an animal to study animal human relationships to observe and document the neighborhood through the lens of an animal and how they inhabit the city it was also to document how the spatiality of the urban form of the city allows different forms of conviviality the thesis argues through drawings that the intense human neighborhood can be seen through a lens of sensorium and form a sense landscape for an animal rather than humans how we see it the dog sees the neighborhood through its nose and that and that terrain is full of several densities colors textures and other various smells all and this way of seeing is completely different that from a human being sensorium densities here of smell create a different perception of space that in turn creates different configuration of space thus these configurations can be used to rethink the infrastructure at a neighborhood level to make it more compatible for all species the site i choose for my research as well as my design is my own neighborhood 
where I have been living since the last 20 years. Lalubai Park area in Andheri West, Mumbai. This neighborhood acts as a connector between Andheri and Parla. This is an Oli plan of the site, just to understand the figure ground. Me, me being a resident of the neighborhood has observed that the site is full of complexities and convivialities. The above site analysis diagram shows that the site allows several human as well as animal inhabitations like walking, cycling, smaller shops are set up, vendors, parking, resting spaces for auto drivers, couples, smokers, tiktokers, animal walkers and stray territories. Thus, this complex and highly active site is seen as a landscape of sensoriums for multiple inhabitations, ignoring all the boundaries. The site even revealed a few metaphors like street as a playground, home, furniture, conviviality, maze, and sensoriums. It was further explored in a three-dimensional model, and this model really helped me in understanding the inhabitations at multiple levels. It also helped me in rethinking of the street infrastructure. This is how I started to see the site after the learnings from the sensorium of the dogs. This is just a different angle of the model. After the careful study of the site, it was broken down into its users and corresponding programs, and thus coming to an overall program that of a neighborhood infrastructure also called as street design. Further taking on the site analysis and the user programs, the architectural strategy used for the project is that of creating a continuous landscape by scooping and folding. The method for vertical inhabitation was thought to be that of a cat tower in the form of a lattice. Then these strategies were placed onto the site and in between the buildings and major vehicular roads, all derived from the logic of animal sensoriums on site. These are a few pictures of the conceptual model. Further zooming into the pictures of, a, of the con conceptual model. Coming to the overall overview of the site. This is where the larger strategies of vegetation, pathways and lattices in between the undulating terrain were thought of. The vegetation strategy being that of to provide a relief space for the existing tree trunk and not choking it directly with the concrete. The pathways for elderly and differently able to navigate through the landscape and the lattice for multiple inhabitation. The diagram on the right shows internal lanes marked in red dotted lines, which again seen in the overall plan on the left are completely taken over by the undulating landscape, vegetation and the lattices. The red dotted rectangle is the part that I further detailed into the project. This is one of the conceptual sections through the main road. Further zooming into the site, this is the detailed site model for the neighborhood. The gray are the pathways, yellow the lattices, brown existing main roads, and the rest is the undulating landscape with the vegetation. The site was detailed with strategic sections and this image is a collage of 16 sections when placed together. I would like to take you all through a few detailed sections. First, the section of a building with the landscape where the land when attached to the building turns itself into a seating. The top right model shows the location of the site uh, of the section and is accompanied by a sensorium drawing for the same. The sensorium drawings are multi-layered with series of several sensorium of smell, textures, and densities. The second section through landscape where it turns itself into vegetation and then into a main road. Section through the landscape forming into a seating, vegetation, and then into a walking trail. Section through one of the playscapes. One through where the land turns itself into the sand pit. The one where the cat tower attaches itself to the building. Several other sections were explored in detail like playscapes, skate parks, vendor zones, food and water bowls for animals. 
the learning from the project was that there are several other agencies and their sensoriums present around us which could be mobilized to understand our surroundings and to rethink the existing physicalities i'll be taking you all through a few pictures of the model this is an image where how i converted the home into a studio and how i worked during the pandemic so to conclude the larger idea of the project is to design the entire landscape between the buildings and the major vehicular roads that doubles the public space for convivialities and inhabitations and these are derived from the logic of animal sensorium drawings here the animal and its senses helps us to rethink the form of our inhabitation thank you thank you devash if anybody has a question all right um now i invite hey, I'm sorry i came in slightly late oh hello sir yeah. sorry i came in slightly late if you could just tell me the title of the project it's all little bit Devesh, in everything of the uh, in betweens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would now request Jai to share his screen. Uh, thank you. Very much. Uh, is my screen visible? Here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Jay Kapadia, recent graduate from SCAT Surat. My thesis suggests a participatory housing approach for conservation-induced displacement. Case of Siddhi community of Karnataka. Human-wildlife interdependency is a key to the existence of human life. Once in a fragmented wildlife habitat, one of the elephant asks the villager, "What are you doing on our land?" To its response, one of the villager asks the same question back. what are you doing on our land then the lion responds says i just updated my google map recently it used to be forest here the question of who actually owns the land leads to human wildlife conflict depending on three dimensions pressure and level of exposure and potential interaction to become conflict habitat fragmentation creates a conflict edge which disturbs the coexistence although india is rich in biodiversity each day a human death is witnessed due to human wildlife conflict The forest tribal communities and wildlife are under a threat as today they compete for limited resources the restrictions to forest led to settlement and agricultural land expansion deforestation which are major reasons for the conflict so on one side are the biological scientists concerned about biodiversity loss while on the other side are the social scientists concerned with livelihood issues of communities so such perspectives are often found in high conflict zones like karnataka one of the biodiversity hotspot and kali tiger reserve is reported as endangered by the worldwide fund for nature and by mapping wildlife corridors vulnerable settlements prone to such conflicts are identified four major communities are vulnerable to conflict and siddi is selected as a case who are an ethnic community arrived from east africa and from merchants to slaves they are left behind as a legacy of colonization after abolition of slave trade so does india remember its only african tribe they remain forgotten in history and these settlements are majorly found in halial and yalapur areas with linear and scattered pattern they have a close association with forest and perform the traditional african dance damal and the major economy is agriculture and a bamboo work so few vulnerable siddhi settlements are identified and by comparative analysis gadoli is selected for the study area then it was identified that more than 70% of the settlement is under encroachment as for revenue and the forest departments and i observed that the settlement has its own character of pedestrian trails religious motives as well as their livelihood issues can be identified so mapping of household size income and open spaces helped me to identify various patterns and housing typologies which exist and six major typologies are identified to understand their perception of house the houses are linear in nature with transition corridors in between and it lacks adequate livable spaces which are responsive to local climate and context 
Mud is a primary material for walls and flooring, while tiles are used for roofing. The traditional contemporary construction method was analyzed to understand the local craftsmanship and the available resources. So issues observed like mud bricks for non-resistance against rain and expensive timber, so which needs to look for alternative materials now. And interviewing people led me to understand their perception and problems which they face today, from racial discrimination to conflicts. So the issues based on various capitals indicate that the community is exposed to fever losses and damages as it competes with wildlife for limited resources. A holistic sustainable development is a need to make a win-win situation for both human as well as wildlife. In my opinion, every case of human wildlife conflict is unique. Understanding human wildlife interaction theory, depletion of wildlife is not an appropriate solution. In the contradictory perspectives of coexistence versus separation, I think both aspects are to be considered at different levels. That is to balance coexistence at regional level with separation at local level for integrated conservation development project. So the question of why such projects often fail to create coexistence between different entities. So on research, major issues which were identified were lack of collaborative practice, a community exclusion in the process and lack of strategic planning. And most importantly, architect is often not involved. So I tried to understand the complex web of interdependencies between different entities like community, wildlife, forest, etc., and agencies like forest and revenue department, NGOs. So I observed that an architect can play an important role at various stages and by extensive research and collaborating with these agencies in various aspects of design. So for that, first of all, we need to reverse the current top-down approach into a bottom-up approach where the community is a leader in the decision-making process rather than just a spectator. So the approach for the project is divided into four factors. That is participatory approach, material and construction, site and services, and incremental approach. So the approach, I had a workshop with the community, with the local CD NGO to understand the perception and evolve various patterns for the design process. The sites, uh, based on participation, three potential sites were identified. And after several analysis, Hozur is the most preferred site considering technical as well as sociocultural aspects of the community. Suitable settlement spot is identified by understanding several layers of topography, buffer zones, climate, existing farmlands, and watershed mapping, etc. And the most appropriate uh, uh, location is the intermediate level between forest and agricultural land, which is also inspired from existing patterns. So the challenge is to prevent future encroachments, adopt self-help construction with incremental nature of dwelling, and adapting existing house pump. So based on different typologies identified, the six parent typologies are proposed with infinite variations to allow diversity in the future adaptations. So the two settlements are linked with a primary road and a lake. And the Gardoli is designed for the initial stage, while separate land is allocated for Wada settlement with additional reserved land for future expansion. So as for analysis, the traditional settlement pattern of small clusters changed to linear formation by administrative boundaries. Idea was to evolve amalgamation of both the patterns to cluster around a central court with a tree known as Karte in the vernacular language. The settlement is distributed along the topography with biofencing as a buffer edge inspired from vernacular settlements to avoid undesirable expansion and prevent future conflict. The supportive amenities are decentralized to generate various activity nodes and the different clusters are linked to a communal spine to retain the existing settlement character. So morning in a CD settlement starts with people going to their fields for cultivation and taking cattle for grazing. And the community visits the church to celebrate various festivals or events like birth of a child or death of, of a family member. And in the afternoon, children reach back home and help in the household domestic activities. And by the evening, the community spine allows informal gatherings in the open spaces, which creates a healthy environment for them. The cluster is designed based on typology mixing and connecting those backyards of dwelling, which will allow social activities. And the Karte, the central court, act as a space to solve the community disputes and also act as a cultural space to perform traditional African dance or rituals and celebrate festivals. The houses are placed respecting natural terrain to minimize land cutting and filling. So the CD house has evolved in various geometries as a continuous process, adapting to changing times. The proposed core house design is based on designing the mosque 
which is a private area which comprises 20% of space and rest allowing users to take control over it with necessary support services foundation is from locally available stone and mud bricks are replaced with csb blocks for better stability and as the red soil is available for roof alternatives to timber bamboo is adopted which will reduce dependence on the forest timber the core house is to be constructed under government subsidy and support services like water supply sanitation school healthcare etc by different departments will be and to allow the flexibility variation in plot size is also adopted different the proposed core house also allow user to decide how much to build when to build and what to build for all six different typologies the in incrementation stage is the user decides the appearance of the house to establish his own house identity allowing diversity in the future adaptations also so user decides the functionality of each space and completes a full house over a period of time depending on his needs each neighborhood is different from one another and the helps to identify their own house with infinite possibilities with increase in size and additional corridor is added to allow natural lighting and also cross ventilation which is absent in existing dwellings the perception of home by each one is not fixed and static but instead it is fluid and multiple which alters and changes with lifestyle and time of uh, the flexibility to paint rear and spaces and add elements like motifs and the kitchen gardens also defines the identity of the community such a process of design with simple understanding develops attachment to the houses and retains the existing lifestyle pattern so a house is a home only when in its making it is the user's participation not the machines so still i would say i am in the process of understanding this complex web with infinite interdependencies among various entities and agencies where the role of an architect can redefine the current practice of conservation projects hence it is a communal art uh, which is not produced by few intellectuals but by spontaneous participation and experience of the whole people under a common heritage to coexist in this ecosystem thank you thank you jay if anybody has any questions or doubts that they would like to ask or clear Okay, then I would now like to invite Deep to share their screen and present their work. Just a minute. <clears throat> So is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Myself, Deep Kanaya, and I uh, recently graduated from Madhya University, Rajput. And today, I am presenting my uh, project, which is reconnecting the past Museum of Maritime History and Ruins at Lowell. First part is about context. So. We all know that ancient civilization helps to develop the modern world, and uh, amongst them, Indus Valley is one such important civilization, and which has various important sites like Harappa, Mohenjo-daro, Dholavira, Lothal. But but Lothal holds its special position, uh, which is situated in the western part of the country, in the state of Gujarat, and uh, which is uh, around 80 kilometers away from the of Ahmedabad. Uh, this is the ancient uh, plan of Lothal. Lothal means the mound of dead, and uh, the uh, ancient city was started around 2600 BC and was excavated in around 1950s. So Lothal shows a good town planning skill as well as it has world's oldest dockyard, which makes this place very unique. So this is the ancient uh, entrance of the ancient town, and this is the dockyard and warehouse. Uh, this part is largely acropolis. This is largely uh, the lower town and the area of bead factory. So Lothal was known for its bead making and pottery, uh, and which were exported in the other part of the world too. So there were an ancient bead, uh, 
uh, which flows alongside the ancient town. So the the addition of the dockyard uh, was very strategic to the uh, because it it was a tidal dock. So whenever river overflows, it water channelized into the dockyard, and that's how it worked. So trading became one such activity of the ancient time, and which is also a medium of cultural exchange. So in a way, Lothal uh, was the origin of India's uh, great maritime history. And there are two uh, villages, uh, one is Gundi, and another one is Taragwala near Lothal, and uh, Lothal is accessed by this single road. Uh, coming to the uh, site photographs, uh, so these are the views of the dockyard. Uh, this is the lower town and the bid factory. So this is the first impression of Lothal uh, in my mind when I visited this site, this half buried structure of warehouses. And I had a few questions in my mind after visiting the Lothal that why, uh, what is the fit of the place? How to respond to the context? Why has Lothal lost its importance? How will the design dimension add a value to the place? And what are the ways through which people can reconnect with their past? So having this question in my mind, I have proceeded further. And through my various case studies, I've observed that museum has uh, immense uh, functional aspect, which are circulation and the relationship of gallery and corridor. So I've studied various examples. And uh, then I found largely these three categories amongst these examples, uh, which are uh, linear movement, free flow movement. And in some cases, it shows both circulation, which are linear and free flow. And then about the gallery and corridor relationship, so uh, it is categorized as separated or they both were merged. So after that, I was thinking about uh, the built environment and, and its impact on the site. And that's why I've decided to design under the ground so that the intervention will not overpower the place. And for that, I, I've studied various examples uh, to understand the characteristics of the cowed out structure. And this is the case of Ajanta case. I've made this toilet plan for my better understanding. And in that, I observed that each cave has various form and size. Uh, uh, it is not showing such sharp edges, and the form are not as precise as we can see on the ground structure. And so uh, each cave has different experiences. Uh, this is a very similar example of Paja Caves, which is in Maharashtra too. Circulation is again very linear. So cave dwelling uh, shows more organic form compared to the previous example. And uh, the transition is again very interesting, like one has to pass through this narrow corridor and then they will expose to the larger body. The head to cathedral is again an important example through which I understood that how to use the indirect light through the geometrical forms and uh, which is adding the depth into the entire wall. After that, uh, I was thinking about the uh, experiential quality of each game. So I've done this small volume exploration. Uh, so each gallery has different uh, volumes and different light sources. And finally, I was thinking about the uh, uh, about the uh, roof as an element on the ground as the structure is submerged. So coming to the design, so uh, metaphorically circuits the uh, origin and the completion of a journey from that very point, then addition uh, corridor to it, then shifting the corridor, uh, the width of the corridor is derived from the strict width of the local. Then the uh, addition of the galleries. So there are major galleries and other auxiliary functions. And the organization of galleries are uh, are very uh, kind of odd, which I have observed in the uh, previous example of the caves. Then uh, change the size according to uh, need. Then the addition of museum shops and a place for refuge and an open space. So I feel uh, a place for refuge is very important in museums because one needs to pause or rest after visiting few galleries. Uh, then the addition of a library and a viewing tower and the administration block, uh, addition of wind towers. And then it, uh, that's what came out. So coming to the site plan, uh, this is the approach road through which one can enter. And this is the ancient town, and this is the site of intervention. 
and this is the uh, sectional relationship between the ruins and the museum so we can see only uh, these uh, different elements on the graph so this intervention trying not to uh, stand alone but it creates a relationship between uh, the ruin and the entire environment so this is the first image uh, of any user while walking this corridor they can uh, see these various elements on the ground uh, so it this corridor became a kind of pavilion for the visitors uh, so they can observe it and visit it to until going down and this is the unfolded section showing the inner circle of the museum and we can see the various elements on the ground and these are the basic forms of the gallery and uh, coming to the museum so uh, journey will start from here so one is gradually going down and then gradually coming up uh, so talking about the uh, entire experience quality uh, the experience and atmosphere in this museum is like one is inside the cave and with this solid masses so this is the unfolded such uh, section of uh, showing the outer circle and this is the viewing tower which establishes the connection between ruins and the museum and these are a few section uh, from the administration area from the open space and from the gallery and these are the same section uh, showing these various elements on the ground and this is the section through which uh, we can see these various element i mean which became the pavilion so that's how it will look so uh, a design started from uh, taking ruins as an origin and i tried and reflect uh, the, and and kind of abstract these those ruins through volumes and uh, which evoke uh, and visitor can uh, uh, reconnect with uh, the current intervention with the past and so in this web of interdependency i uh, identified my role as a narrator and to narrate this built environment with spatial experiences which helps visitors to reconnect with the past so yeah, i would like to thank everyone uh, for the constant support and thank you kvd for the opportunity thank you deep if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask okay uh, so now uh, miss heringer and nilkan chaya both have joined us um i would just take, uh, quickly introduce uh, both of them and also welcome them to the forum uh, anna heringer is an architect and an honorary professor of the unesco chair of earth and architecture building cultures and sustainable development she focuses on the use of natural building materials and has been actively involved in development cooperation in bangladesh since 1997 her diploma work the meti school in rudrapur won the aga khan award for architecture in 2007 thank you miss heringer for joining us professor nilkan chaya is an architect and academician who taught at the school of architecture sept After having practiced and taught in Nairobi, he moved his base from Africa to India. He has been greatly interested in teaching architecture, and his practice is a reflection of his intense involvement with the school. He has researched and worked extensively in the domain of architecture, and is socially and technologically appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chaya, for uh, joining us. I would now ask uh, Kashikar and Rahul Chandrasekhar to commence the discussion. Right. Uh, thank you, Heer. Uh, thank you, all the presenters, uh, for uh, giving us insight into your work, and thank you, all the respondents and the panelists, be present here today. So, uh, I just want to restate the fact that the idea of uh, the forum was not meant to be an independent critique, but rather uh, it's meant to use these projects as triggers to discuss uh, larger ideas and directions uh, our profession is headed in. so having said that usually uh, there is an emphasis on discussing the what and why uh, when we discuss a design process and what i mean by that is uh, either the why is gathered by uh, investigating the premise of the design or we get into the what by trying to investigate the final output or product of this process 
but very rarely uh, do we get to see uh, the challenges uh, the difficulties and excitements that the students uh, face when they're sort of going about this process so uh, i'll quickly just sort of share my screen to sort of begin the discussion is is it visible to everyone yes yeah yes. Uh, so um in sort of light of this uh, uh, what and why dilemma. Today, we'll be discussing the how. And uh, to quickly run through uh, what we sort of identified in these uh, in each of these projects, uh, we have Madhuli's project first, where uh, the, the, the function and the purpose determine the design process and the sequence of silk cultivation uh, where, like informed the organization plan and the design process. Then the next was Jair's project where what we found interesting here was there was a participatory approach and uh, at the same time there was an incremental approach. So what happens after the architect has intervened and handed over uh, the, uh, the sort of building to the user group and how does this sort of feed back into the participatory approach. Uh, third, we have uh, Deep's project where uh, here what was unique was although a standard program, the design used uh, abstraction as a primary driver to the process. And it was also uh, the architect uh, who played the role of a meaning maker and took this process ahead. Uh, fourth, we also have Devarsh's project where here, what we found interesting in the process is that it had an atypical focus and it deals with more than one program because it's also uh, sort of considering the non-human uh, entity when he's designing. Um, so flashing, like flash <clears throat> on the screen right now is just uh, sort of four qualities that we uh, found keeping in mind what the uh, theme was today. And I just like to sort of uh, say that this is not a definitive way of looking at these projects. This was just something we felt we should put forth to give you an idea of how we uh, sort of uh, group these projects for today's discussion. Um, and so sort of setting the base, uh, the first trigger, uh, that I would like to sort of maybe throw in in the discussion is that, uh, we're usually sort of, uh, exposed to a site study that precedes the design process and very often, or not very often, uh, you have a very generic way of going about it where you, uh, op like you sort of investigate people or you sort of observe and have interviews with people in and around the site you uh, sort of uh, do a study in all the buildings around the site or maybe found on site there are uh, uh, road networks that are uh, considered climate and so on and so forth and the same can also be said uh, about programmatical studies that are taken where you refer to buildings which have either dealt with uh, similar area statements similar programs or even similar conditions so my first question to, uh, uh, to sort of kickstart this discussion is how does this process or how can a process engage with its culture, context and people better to arrive at a nuanced uh, solution in design? And I'd like, um, I'll stop sharing my screen now and I'd like to sort of open this discussion to all the respondents in the panel. Yeah. Professor Chaya, if you would sort of like to. Yeah, yeah it's a difficult one. No? Um, actually, I came in when the uh, two of the projects, I think one of them is Devarsh's inhabiting the uh, in between, which was, and the last slide in that was some dogs were fighting and there was the space in between. And then the next project came up and it was the elephants and the humans who were sort of not fighting, but in conflict, I suppose. So it occurred to me that one of the ways of looking at any context is to other one part of the context. So often the animal becomes the other and is completely different from us. The animal sensorium, it seems, uh, according to Devarsh, is completely different from our sensorium, or maybe very similar, I don't know. And the elephant 
elephant's intentions and the human's intentions are different. Now then, that also happened to the Siddhis when they became the othered people to whom housing had to be provided. Unfortunately, I didn't see the Silk Sanjog project, so I can't talk about that. But it seemed to me that in every case, we have to create a distance in order to study something. We have to make it something which is uh, exotic, elephants or yeah, dogs or uh, siddhis for that matter. And siddhis, if you make them exotic, uh, and you know, I, I, I was born in Kenya and grew up there. So I know that there is no such dance called Dhamal. Dhamal is a Gujarati name. And it's, it, there's no such dance. So we have exoticized them just as we have exoticized the elephant or we have exoticized the stray dog. And I think that is where the study of context uh, requires much more than the standard dimensions that you have mentioned in your straightforward site study. And that, that the, um, uh, the ability to become an elephant for a while, or a siddhi, or any, anything, maybe a silk weaver, I don't know. That, I think that to transpose oneself is at the is sense of learning context. And I think uh, there I find also that the manner of, of drawing now, nowadays, in iconic forms, rather than actual um, studies or actual emotional responses, the iconic forms in substitute. And there I find that there is a greater othering now. And there I, I find that all the students' work is very interesting. Their projects are fantastically challenging and they've done very nice work. But I think that one thing that we need to look at is how do we uh, become the elephant? Yeah, I leave it at that. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to uh, maybe ask uh, Anna uh, to uh, talk about this a bit more because in her work, she always uh, pays a lot of attention to the, the local in, in understanding uh, uh, the locale, the people in that locale. But also very interestingly, Anna, you also mentioned uh, that for you, architecture is, is the vehicle through which you would like to strengthen cultural and individual confidences or support local economies and so on. So how do you look at this uh, uh, studying the context uh, in terms of process? So if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And I'm sorry, I know you've been waiting for me. <laughs> I got caught up with the time shifts. I don't know, I, I'm really bad <laughs> in, in keeping this is time schedules, I'm, I'm really sorry. But I really enjoyed listening to, to your presentation and I have the feeling you're much more close to the people and the context than a lot of people around the globe or architecture students or architects around the globe. And I, I, I see this tendency a lot from students from India that I have the pleasure to work with that the engagement with communities is much stronger. And I, I think that's really, something very beautiful and, and just something that we have to copy as well. So when I'm starting a project, I think, you know, it's a twofold way. I'm, I'm studying always like the, the local material sources and, you know, the materials that, that are available. And for that, I also need practical know-how, you know, especially I'm, I'm working with, with clay, with mud a lot. This is my favorite material at all of all, all the materials I've worked with. And therefore I really need hands-on experience to really understand that material. This is nothing that you can learn theoretically. This is really something I need. I mean, never, it's like skiing. You cannot ski in a theoretical way where you have to stand there and have to test it. So this kind of practical knowledge, I think is, is, is a key for me. Of course, I'm studying the local 
crafts and all the information, the culture that is there. But then I'm I'm really completely free in my mind, you know, and, and I'm it's like I'm, I sit down every day to meditate for an hour and I really try to get more and more into this. I think, you know, this to understand the, the need, real needs of human beings, I think we have to look within. We can do a lot of research outside. We can do, you know, a lot of questionnaire and so on. But I think, you know, we in the end, we are all really very, very similar as human beings. Yes, we have different sort of cultural tones and and maybe some yeah some 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 family patterns that we inherited somehow but i think uh, if we take all these ego noises away i think we are all very similar as human beings and the more we look inside you know what we really need a sense of belonging you know also a sense to to show our talents, to, to also unfold our talents, the self-actualization or, or self-empowerment somehow. If we are aware of these things, and of course shelter and, and you know food and all these things, but if we are aware of our real needs, then I think we design also much more precise to these needs. So, um, and I think the ultimate um, approach for me is really this like, local materials, local energy sources, especially the craftsmanship, and then global know-how, because I think, you know, the know-how should not be limited to a place. It should always be applied, you know, kind of radiating, and we just should take all these ideas that are coming and then, you know, apply it to a, to a space. So when I'm designing, I'm designing on a large piece of clay and really try to get myself completely empty and try, you know, to bring all these ideas and impulses that I, I'm receiving. I'm just trying that it flows into my hands and then I'm shaping this piece of clay and I'm working rough. Just as you said, <laughs> we, we are, you know, we are, I'm not trying to create any icons in the beginning. I work really rough. I work, just let it flow and change and change and change. I call it clay storming, just like brainstorming, you know, kicking out ideas. And not judging myself, you know, we are so fast in judging ourselves. And that judge tells us, you know, it has to look iconic. It has to look already super good in the beginning. The sketch has to be super clean and everything. No, you know, I'm just working rough into the clay. And let me lead by this feeling, you know, when it feels right. And I think everyone knows when you're in the midst of the process and you have suddenly have this feeling, ah, now I got it, you know, it makes click. So I let me guide with this kind of feeling. And, you know, I have to, I don't have this feeling in the beginning. I have to work on it. You know, I'm just letting my hands rotate. And then when I have to feel, ah, now I can get a, a sense of the character of this project. I just go with this, just go with this feeling. And then, you know, it's just, and that even works in team. And I even bring, you know, this, this still wet clay models to the clients. Also here in Germany, we work on it together. And then the clients maybe say, yeah, but we would like to have everything on the floor, on the ground floor. You know, we don't want to climb stairs. Then I just literally cut the entire project into halves, you know, and place it on the ground. And they see, oh, okay, now we don't have a garden anymore. <laughs> okay, then it's very clear. You save a lot of discussions, you know. You and and then you think, you know, maybe the most functional thing is to make everything scaling up in a tower. Then you build the tower, and then you see immediately, woof, this is like too much of load on this on this site. And then you're cutting it down until it feels right, the right proportion, the right scale. So this is how I'm kind of designing. And I heard it a lot, you know, about the process. And that made me very much happy that you had so much focus on the process because I think the folk, that the process is just as important as the outcome. And we need to learn to design the process again. And this is something we in Europe are so detached from the process because of all the liabilities and all insurances and all you know standards and rules and regulations. And um, this, this is something, a power that we have to fight again that we get it back because the real power in architecture really lies in the process. You know, we can build up a structure building and at the same time we can build up a community. And this is the power of the process, you know. Do we, do we design with materials or, or is this building and finally built with materials where a lot of people can participate or do we need experts for this? For example, 
you know that's why i'm also liking clay so much because everyone can participate in it because you literally need only your hands for doing this when you need lots of tools it's difficult for people to participate and so on so the process is just as important and i think you know about the functions i mean you mentioned it already i mean this form follows function is just outdated i think this we are much um beyond that kind of form follows function sentence and for me you know the most the most important ingredient is love because when we built out of love we towards the people towards the planet we automatically build it sustainably that's just a side effect and for me a formal expression of love is beauty and that is kind of our the biggest power that we have in our hands because we work with beauty and i think the biggest struggle that we are always facing when it comes to sustainability in architecture is the fear you know when we work with vulnerable materials such as clay there's always the fear and if you work with natural materials and if we you know people love building walls because they want to be safe but then you know where's the the feeling of community so i think you know we only can counteract this fear when we when we have the love on our side and the love is really and 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 beauty is the formal expression of love so i think we are quite strong in our profession and i see you all i mean the project i like them very much and and the approach i think in comparison to the projects that i'm seeing in many universities that i'm working i see a lot of love in this project towards the people and and also the planet and therefore i want to thank you thanks thanks anna for that Uh, so I I was wondering based on uh, what both of you were saying. In fact, I was imagining that uh, what if a painter and a uh, ethnographer went to a new habitat uh, to study it, and the painter uh, sets up their easel and starts painting as a way of of understanding society, whereas someone else comes uh, with. Uh, with very extensive field notes as a way of you know studying a new culture or studying a new society uh, by carefully observing noting down etc so i was just uh, uh, i i wanted to uh, throw this to ranjit as to how do you see this uh, different ways in which we can understand the context that we are working in and and are there different ways in which one can engage with society in order to understand it uh, uh, if not better in a more nuanced manner maybe thank you for the question uh, vishnuath and uh, it's marvelous to have heard the eloquent accounts both of professor chaya and of uh, anna just now uh, the thought i had whilst i was looking at all of the four presentations and engaging with them was about equity the three broad thoughts the first was uh, hinged around this marvelous french expression uh, deformation professionnelle uh, professional deformation which attends any profession as a result of its training it's not meant to be a prejudicial term it's just how one's way of approaching the world is shaped by one's training it happens to all of us and how often we have to be critical of that training and of that perspective we are given because repeatedly if our marvelous as all four projects were madhuri devarsh jay and uh, deep in each case i found the question coming around to uh, what role does the architect take over in this process what role is being played so uh, i kept coming back to the image of some kind of sovereign architect who had somehow the ability to command control be a sort of conductor and composer of things and in each case i thought to myself my goodness each of these projects is set in a highly asymmetric society with immense differences of privilege of power of participation i heard the term participation all the time but i thought to myself jay for instance in your uh, i know something of this community the first poem in my new book is called Siddhi Mubarak Bombay it's in it it refers to a 19th century slave an enslaved person in Bombay something we don't admit to ourselves much here on the west coast but it's a fact of our lives you know i thought to myself how much of this has come from the community you know you they were subjects of interviews but to what extent were they co-creators with you of their new environment 
And to what extent did you as an architect play into an, a minefield? The new draft Forest Act, for instance, is a minefield. It doesn't, it doesn't even understand what forests are. Its understanding of the forest is a plantation. It has no time for wetlands. It has no time for marshes, no time for many of the ecologies which are important to Siddhi life, for instance. And people are just the unfortunate nuisance that gets in the way. So in what way are you compromised as an architect involved in a resettlement program? That's a question I would seriously wonder, uh, you know, not to not to be taken personally, but it's something to think about as you move on into your career. With Deep, I found myself asking the same question. It's a marvelous idea. The underground um, circulation and the rising up in a periscopic way to foci of, of attention. But I thought to myself, uh, you said Deep that you were going to be an architect uh, who was going to be a narrator. You had command over this narrative. But this narrative is already part of a larger hyper-nationalist ideology at this point. What is your investment in that hyper-nationalist ideology? To what extent are we going to be able to see Lothal for what it was, not as something that was presuming a nation that would come 2000 years later, but as something that came from immense entrepreneurial creative energy, uh, it was the beginnings of a certain civilization. How are we going to look at these things without that nationalist optic, which is now increasing? You, everybody knows what's happening with, uh, I hate to point it out to uh, people in a sept context, but you know what's happening with the Central Vista. So these are the questions. I mean, to what extent are these questions of equity, of ideology, of participation in a larger political life? And these are inevitable, you know? So I would suggest that there's a certain assumption of innocence on the part of the architect, as though you could take this role. But you are part of a network and a maze of agencies and institutions and impulses and, 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 and compromises. And these have to be tested out. With Devarsh again, I thought, what a lovely idea. This is wonderful. You take the POV of, of an animal. Also, by the way, Devarsh, you kept uh, referring to smell as your preferred mode into a sensorium. I kept thinking, because I'm a dog person, I kept thinking dogs hear differently from us. They hear, they hear the range of hearing frequency is completely different. So what if you designed your, your sense, sense scape on in terms of uh, auditory experience? There again, I thought to myself, there and with Jay's conflict edge, you know, how are we going to resolve multi-species communication? Anna spoke eloquently of love, but that love must extend beyond our understanding of the human species to the, these other species that we've marginalized, instrumentalized, and now in some way, Devarsh, your project wants to make space and thus provide some kind of equity and justice there. But how is that going to be, to be seen through? You know, a couple of days ago, I had a marvelous conversation with Prem Chandavarkar, the architect. We've often had conversations and exchanges over the years. He was saying something about how, as he said before, what happens when the architect finishes with the building, leaves the site? What then is the resonance of what the architect has done? And I know it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, what control do you have over human relationships and dynamics as they play out? But to what extent can you, as you've tried Devarsh in your design, I can see from how you've handled the various elements, but to what extent can you leave some abiding contribution that extends beyond your architecture, you know? And I, and I think that is a question I would ask Vishwanath in response to your prompt. I think we have to be able to think about how architects can be contributors to larger questions of public discourse, uh, of equity, as I just said. And it doesn't end with your site and building and you're done and out of there. You know, you must think about how you continue to be a contributor. Madhali, with you, I, you know, it was in one sense the neatest of the projects. It seemed already to have all the uh, moving parts were in great consonance and so on. But there were certain things you said in your historical account that I wondered about. For one thing, uh, not that you had to say absolutely everything about the silk trade, but it does go back to the Silk Road. There's a 2000 year history to this. You focused very much on the colonial history, which indeed is fine. But I was struck that you bought into a kind of ideology of individual states. You know, there was at least one part which clearly came from the policy of, of the institution where you said, we have to reduce reliance on Karnataka. And, you know, whilst there's some case for, you know, self-reliance and all that, 
our history as a subcontinent is a history of interdependencies among regions. I hate to say it, but Mahatma Gandhi via, you know, it was really Metcalf's idea. He had it all wrong. This slightly mad idea of the independent, what was it again, the autonomous village republics. That is not the history of India. South Asia has always been incredibly interconnected by routes of trade, migration. Many of you know this already. So why can that not be translated into, into what you're doing? You know, I mean, to what extent did you question or resist or critique the institutional mandate in this case? And might it not have been even better if those cross state border interdependencies, if they'd been uh, replenished, if new forms of communication and dialogue had been sought out? So that's something else I'd throw into play, apart from these political questions. How do you as architects uh, create new forms of translation among the different constituencies you're working with? You know, it might be NGOs, it might be the forest department. I think architects do have a very crucial role to play, but it may exceed your, so to speak, professional role. So my plea in conclusion would be that you seriously consider these other forms of contribution. And if you look at, Look at our own post-colonial masters. You will find that Charles Correa, for instance, I always think of how Charles worked with film at a key point when the new Bombay uh, project seemed to be sinking. He went to films division and produced an incredible documentary, uh, City on the Water. So you have to be able to think outside of the professional box in this way. So that would be my uh, sort of plea in conclusion. But thanks so much for your attention. I think that that is, uh, yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, I, I was just saying, yeah, I think that's a very important point. And what you'd really like to get into in the discussion is, if, if I think of this from a student's perspective, or maybe even for us, uh, I think we keep hearing a lot of this and rightly so that as architects, we should not forget that we're also citizens and therefore we should be aware of the, the political angle, the cultural, the economic, the environmental angle of uh, what we should be thinking about while we are designing. But uh, very often what happens, I see is that uh, uh, it ends up taking two directions. Either you get completely bogged down by the enormity of the task in front of you. And therefore, uh, one is very scared to put pencil on paper and start drawing. Or you end up saying that, no, no, forget all that. I'll just make a plan which will work. And I, I think it would be very interesting as we go ahead in the session to discuss how do we as architects start engaging with this, the enormity of it, and how do we enter into this chakra view kind of thing, if I may <laughs> uh, put it so. But Rahul, you were saying something. Maybe it was about the second point. That you yeah, yeah. So actually, yeah. just following what you had brought yeah. up, uh, there is a spectrum of ways to go about it in terms of method where uh, usually uh, a student or a professional in this case uh, deploys like multiple options uh, or investigate like various types of handling a single idea or there is and that's lying on one end of the spectrum on the other end you have uh, sort of uh, arriving at a single idea and trying to go about your process just to pay at one uh, solution to arrive at this one timeless piece or object or output. Um, so what, I mean, in terms of how if I had to sort of take up two projects or two op cases here, if you look at uh, Jez's approach where he's uh, sort of, uh, you know, looked at many types before or proposed many types. And then you have at the other end, you have Deep's case where he has taken one idea of the circle and then started developing it across the process. Uh, so how, I mean, my question is, how does one, or how do uh, the respondents of the panel view this? Is it something that's decided by the architect? Is it something that's, uh, that's sort of taken from the site? Is it a predetermined choice that's made? Or, I mean, why does this happen? Or are there other ways of dealing? That's my question. Was I audible? I hope. Sorry if I rushed. Yeah. Uh, Rahul, maybe you want to quickly share the screen again? Where, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just. Yeah. 
so what uh, while he's doing that what we thought was that uh, because we are talking so much of process we thought let us also share with everyone the process that myself and rahul went through in trying to understand the project and sort of frame this session so just to very quickly uh, reiterate so when we were looking at the four projects uh, in this particular case we noticed that uh, uh, i think in in the housing project uh, there there is a lot of options which are being developed and there is also discussion of participatory design approach and maybe the housing also having a life after the architect has left the scene because it's an ongoing thing and on the other hand is a process where uh, in the lothal museum uh, case where it is trying to arrive at that one Uh, uh sort of solution and maybe not solution but the that one beautiful pristine well proportion designed object and uh, yeah so we thought that, that that could be another sort of interesting point of discussion that while you are designing uh do do we imagine that eventually we will end up with one solution which will be or one iteration or one design which would be the probably the most appropriate response to a given condition or do we proceed in the other direction where we say that uh, let us let us have a multitude of options and let's see where it goes i think kashi the word options is a difficult ah. word i okay i i i find it typical of a certain procedural mindset whereas most of us are are uh, open to many many things that are happening all around us far away as uh, ranjit was pointing out or near very near as anna was pointing out and all of these things are continuously happening now in that of uh, one of the things which is in in the air is that by and large our aesthetic uh, choices have been shaped by the professional training as ranjit was pointing out that the unified single entity object is privileged over every other form of but look at a conversation like i'm right now we are talking and we take one thing at a time and suddenly if it was not on zoom but we were actually sitting in a room and talking to each other and we didn't have an audience to answer to then we would in between talk about the taste of the of the juice or maybe the fruit that i saw the other day um, the joke that happened between me and the rickshaw man in between and still come back to the main thread from time to time so it's a it's a sort of weaving and we have to learn to think about design as a weaving even for example where you say um, in the um, in the um, jays project where many many alternative configurations are shown there is still only one set of things and the katte while it was talked about the katte was never actually shown the path was not shown the trees were not talked about the the cows were not shown and all of that that is actually so i have to meander through the process in which i will gather things and maybe start putting them side by side weaving them sometimes just slapping them together and sometimes getting uh, uh, an awkward even clumsy result for a while and after maybe a day or two it will become slightly softer and i'm sure anna has this experience of working with clay which does the same thing that it hardens and then you got to do things to it and you know need it and and 
so this is what happens to the imagination. Imagination has to be continuously needed, otherwise it hardens. And I think this one of the things that is taught in schools is how to use a hardened process and how to quickly take out small bricks of thought and say, this is a better brick or that one is not such a good brick, you know? And, and instead of that, maybe just watering it might be a good way. So I think that um, I don't make a choice between a single thought and a um, number of options. I think you've got to weave all those things together into something textured. That is what is actually um, really the power of life is texturing. And if we miss that, then we are only making objects. And I think this is where I, I, I feel that a lot more can happen. Yes. Sorry for I taking really, so long. I very yeah. much like this image of, of weaving. I think that's what's happening. I mean, and that's why I'm, I'm really training myself in training my intuition or my connection to intuition because then, you know, this bi-associative bi um, thinking, it's kind of, you're not just linearly approaching something, but <laughs> you have to have it yeah. from all sides. And I think that is something, you know, I mean, designing is nothing but decision-making, constant decision-making. And the best decisions are always taken, you know, out of a gut feeling and out of intuition. And I think, you know, you can train your intellect and that's what we usually do in our education system, but we can also train our connection to, to intuition. And I think, yes, we have to take decisions. I mean, it's not just giving a lot of options, but it's designing is decision-making. It's, That's it, and and we and when we take the wrong decisions, I figured out when I'm taking wrong decisions, then you know problems come on the side, and they that's another layer, you know, and that that just let me change the direction, and I'm I, I I'm fully confident now. I or have this trust, you know, if I'm taking the wrong decision, I'm getting getting a second chance, you know, <laughs> there's some problem coming up or some wall that I you know make me change the direction. But um, just giving too many options and, and shying away from de decisions, I think, is, is difficult. I think that's, that's the point, is that we're really keeping our channels open and, and take the right decisions that are kind of in harmony with the context and with the people. Maybe Ranjit could tell us something about how he hears the words as he speaks. <laughs> or, right, or rights, because I'm sure that there's not a fixed thing that he has, but he hears almost as he speaks. And the next sound balances the earlier sound and it goes on like that. And I think it's a wonderful thing that you do with that. Huh, Ranjit? Thank you, Professor Chai. But, you know, I, I think we're all in consonance here, you, Anna, and what I'm about to say. I think what we're looking at is a certain dialogue between pattern and uh, whatever is thrown at us by the situation. So you try and create a cadence, some musicality by using these. So now all this sounds like metaphor, but it isn't. It served weavers very well, for instance. I always think, for instance, of uh, the great Gutai artists in the, in the great Japanese avant-garde in the 1950s. You know, one of them said, uh, uh, Shiraga, actually, he said, uh, I always listen to the cry of the material. And, you know, I read this years and years ago when I was a teenager, and I've never forgotten this. That in any discipline, any art, you have to be responsive. You have to be responsive to the cry of the material, which could be any. It could be clay. It could be the warp and weft. It could be the sight. Uh, people are not material, but a certain community situation could well be your, the material you're responding to. And you have to develop a certain kind of transformative listening. And, and uh, you have to... It's eventually an ethical question. And I think for me, uh, again, as I said, I, I really enjoyed hearing all the four, four presentations, but I just kept thinking, why are these processes so keen to be persuasive? You want to persuade us, you want to take us through the steps of your process. Wonderful. And I totally appreciate that you each had, it was like Pecha Kucha, you had a very limited amount of time and you got to do what you had to do. But 
I would also have appreciated detours, meanderings, false movements. That's another phrase, by the way, that's stuck in my head from a long ago German new wave movie, Falsche Bewegung, you know, you gotta take the, take the wrong turn, you know, come up against some kind of wall, pull back. How would you, even when you're representing your process, what is it that inhibits you as professionals? Uh, I understand it's kind of performance anxiety. There's a client who wants to be assured that you know what you're doing, but how do you bring into the design process and also convey it as a legitimate thing? Precisely this, you know, the detours, the meanderings, uh, false movements, not as options, but as phases in your journey to get to where you had to get. And I think that, that that's vital. You know, I, something else that came up may not be immediately relevant, but uh, an essay that Isaiah Berlin wrote a long time ago called The Hedgehog and the Fox was about the shape of ideas. The hedgehog has one big idea and never deviates. The fox has a lot of small ideas and then builds a pattern out of that. And we know that no one really functions in that binary way. You're sometimes hedgehog and sometimes fox. But I think it's useful to Keep that in mind, you know, that you're, you're never necessarily, sometimes you, the one great idea may well be the idea. And sometimes it's these, you know, the different parts that you bring together that create a constellation that delivers some profound design result. Uh, there's no formula here, but these are some of the thoughts that I think would be, I, I, would, I would also, I know Howard Rock is probably not taken seriously as a form, as a great ideal of architecture anymore, but I hate to say it, but when I, you know, when you meet people on engineering campuses and sometimes architecture schools, the phantom of work is somewhere at the back. Do you always have to communicate absolute confidence? Sometimes it helps to demonstrate that you also have a vulnerability. You know, I think architects feel keenly this pressure that, you know, you need to be trusted as the expert. When you do that, you become part of a technocracy and an expert culture that ends up being anti-democratic. So, uh, actually, while uh, you were speaking, I, I was also reminded of uh, this uh, Nelson Goodman's Languages of Art, where I find it very interesting, where he, in, in the latter part, he talks about the relationship between uh, the script and the play. Uh, the score and the actual piece of music and the drawing and architecture, which, uh, which, which to me is a very interesting discussion about how do we as creators engage with the, with the creation and what are the tools at our disposal? So I think that that's another completely fascinating. Absolutely. Angle. Totally. Agree. Yeah. But, uh, but I would also like to get our presenters into this discussion. I think uh, all the four presenters, I'm sure there are many layers to the process or what they were thinking or their challenges or their hesitancies, which typically I think this is another problem of these presentations and juries that we are, like you're saying, many of you are saying, it, there seems to be this sort of unwritten rule that you have to hide all your hesitations and come out as very persuasive and strong. But maybe this is a good time to also ask our presenters to sort of uh, come into the discussion and, and maybe talk of what, what was actually happening while you were going through this, uh, this process of designing. So if uh, any uh, Deva, Shavjay, or Deep, Madhuli, if anyone would like to pitch in. I can so, begin. Yeah, yeah, sure. Madhuli, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, talking genuinely about the situations or the process that I have been through. So uh, right from the initial stage, I was quite aware of the fact that whatever the concerns or the problems or the issues are, are more of a social, cultural, economical, uh, economic uh, nature. And then uh, the factor wherein you have to think about an architectural solution uh, was a trick to me because somewhere down the line, I also knew that uh, it might not help. So uh, that was the first point. And um, I think it was with time that I realized that uh, okay, fine, there were these set of problems. And then I thought that this can be a proposal to all this. That is the first part. But it was during the process of uh, KVDF when I realized 
that actually uh, whatever i've designed or whatever the intervention is is more of a step one to build further so uh, i cannot say it is a solution right now it was something that at that point i felt that i had to address those issues that time for those concerns and then after that maybe there can be branching out after that or other aspects that can come in not only just uh, in context to weavers or farmers there can be other aspects too so i thought that was something as a continuous process which cannot have an end so this i guess will keep evolving as we keep thinking and we keep, uh, get exposed to newer aspects itself so yeah that's it that's that's very interesting before uh, our other presenters talk i just want to connect this to anna's point about decision making or being decisive that there is this uh, decade problem that we want to take decisions only when we are sure of things and maybe throughout the decision uh, the design process during the semester we are unsure of whether what we are doing is right or wrong and therefore one delays the decision making process because i wonder is this because somewhere it's an unwritten rule that in order to decide you need to be sure of things until you are not sure you should be indecisive but i i i found that connection very very interesting i just noticed that you know still many years after you know the meta school and yoga kana what i was still waiting for someone telling me this is good or bad and i realized oh man this <laughs> is the heritage of of my education my architectural education you know and i also see that my students are constantly waiting for my thumb you know like but you know we have to <laughs> we have to train ourselves to to get a feeling of what feels right yeah. and trust in this feeling otherwise we we keep looking in the outside until someone an architectural critique a professor whatever tells us this is good or bad but i mean we have to learn this decision making and to trust on on you know on our inner voice would any of the other presenters like to add yeah. to what madhuri said oh shall i add so 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 like what uh, you all are talking about the decision making so i think the decision making in my process was very much crucial from starting to the end of the process because at every stage i thought that whatever the decision i was making there there are several consequences also of it which i am aware or might not be aware because uh, everything was debatable even from starting with when i uh, thought about the uh, conservation when i uh, started to uh, listen about the social scientists what they are saying so it was complete dilemma and there were even news articles coming that the authorities are trying now to uh, relocate them from the outside of the protected areas so i thought that they have been this uh, like the conflict is not because of these two entities but it is of the third entity the restrictions or maybe the different influences which have indirectly or directly affected this uh, interaction that how human and wildlife interaction converted into human and wildlife conflict so the idea was that the uh, that uh, that it was a very bold decision that uh, that as an architect if i relocate them then i had to see one very important aspect that that was a first crucial decision because i still i i am not exactly saying that i am right or wrong exactly but that if the authorities are talking about relocating that what is a strategy do they have any strategy that they are talking about 10 million tribals to be relocated do they have any strategy or something that if they are trying to conserve forest also so i thought that i had to find something an interaction model which talks about both the entities and still there is a separation at certain level but there is a coexistence at certain level which they have so i was trying to focus on that 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 as an architect can that sensibility be added at at a certain level to initiate this process and then i thought that without the participation of this entity it is not possible so like i could not there were certain limitations that i could not work with the community for a longer period due to the pandemic situation all everything but still i tried to understand that that their life patterns and everything that where the every decision which i take and even at times i thought that i designed the whole house even 
but at some point that uh, i thought that i cannot decide their houses or their vernacular houses which they have built and which have evolved over generations so at at point i at one point i thought that i cannot build now more i have to think something multiple entities or flexible that they will be deciding because that is something we face in india today that the housing which they have provided they the designs do not talk about their perception of a home these are just houses so so i tried at a, at my level maximum that that is something which they are also decision makers that this house is not of something which talks about present time but something which talks about their future perceptions their future adaptations also so that was something the decisions were making for me was very crucial and i am not aware that actually they were true because this was something at academic or maybe in professional it might have a different uh, opinion completely just very quick note yeah. jay i just want to say i might have sounded critical earlier but i actually want to say that you took a very compassionate view of the you know the reasoning that you had for your resettlement is actually far more compassionate than this state ever brings into being project displaced people and people who are resettled in this brutal way are actually given the most the worst and least profitable land and no one cares how they live there uh, whereas your attentiveness to geographical factors uh, water table the vegetation actually was far more compassionate than officially would ever have been done for that community I just wanted to say that thank you sir any of other presenters so, okay. yeah so uh, yeah. i i want to add Uh, Rahul asked that uh, uh, the process revolves around the circle and whether it is predetermined or not. So uh, I want to uh, uh, reply that uh, uh, initially, uh, I mean, in this ten-minute presentation, I cannot uh, able to show the entire uh, process or concept. But initially, we uh, decided the site right beside the dockyard. so the circulation was very linear and uh, galleries are uh, uh, the plug to the corridor and every time you are uh, uh, looking to the dockyard and again start moving in the uh, so that's how it worked uh, suddenly uh, the by i mean uh, one of the north asi came that uh, would have to build 200 meter away from the uh, protected moment and then i shifted the site act as near as possible but i shifted the site and as i was focusing on generating the experience uh, uh, as we discussed about decision making and so uh, that's how i decided to uh, you know choose the circle uh, in a way to and reach the entire experience uh devarsh would you also like to add because i'm quite intrigued i'm sure you uh, you're not telling us lot of behind the scenes thing i mean you are doing a project which you're talking of other species and i'm sure yeah. there might have been sort of heated debates or discussions with faculty or with your peers and yes yeah, so yeah i mean uh, the presentation that you saw today was the cleanest thing that i could get out of my project and my process i would like to start speaking about the actual process which was like how do you see animals and what i started off with was my own neighborhood because it was covid times i could not move out of the neighborhood so i started off with my neighborhood and just to understand animals i started chasing them all around and all day long so like since morning to evening and my parents would be like what are you doing outside and and i would have to explain to them that i'm chasing animals and they would be like is this architecture what are you doing you are in the fifth year you are in the final year this is your thesis stop doing all this so i started off with chasing animals and then started you know actually inhabiting the animal so i started off with uh, i mean there were multiple options that i could uh, think of of animals i mean dogs cats birds cows lots of animals that were in my neighborhood but to uh, narrow it down i selected dog the dog to be specific because i found more of the dogs 
in my neighborhood and uh, similarly to narrow it further down i chose uh, how we human see the world is with our eyes and it's a very visually dominated world for us and similarly for dogs how they see the world is their smell and the smell scape so and that is how they are i mean that is that is the main reason why i left out the ear the taste and the other senses i mean of course i wanted to explore all of those because if uh, knowing the project that uh, i did was like smell could um, open up so many ideas for me then like only one sense then what would other four senses open up for me so like that was a very uh, that was a continuous question that i was you know uh, relating to arguing to but just for the sake of narrowing down and narrow narrowed it down to smell because it was the most dominant one and through learning through smell i learned that there are so many uh, ways that it in, like the uh, dog inhabits the city and how we an, inhabit the city is completely opposite to it i mean we start building boundary walls and compound walls and footpaths and roads and what not but when you see a dog inhabiting the city it doesn't care about what building it is in it is sometimes on top of the uh, roof of a building or on a boundary wall or on someone's private car which we would never even think of sitting on i mean it's i have a picture of a dog who literally every day sits on the top of the car and the same car and a picture where a, a the dog shares an auto rickshaw i mean the auto driver is uh, taking like he's performing his activity morning to night but in the night he parks his auto there and the dog becomes his customer in the night because every night the dog is occupying the seat and it's not only one night but it happens continuously and that opened up so many ideas that how could we then rethink and reimagine the city at even if it's at a neighborhood level so i mean that is how i started even designing things because i mean usually what we do is we take a paper and pencil and we start drawing but this time i was so confused that i didn't know how to start off like where to draw the line so i started uh, the opposite way i mean if you saw my presentation i started off with models only like i took a clay and i started modulating the land in whatever way i could with my hand and that started opening up so many ideas again because uh, i couldn't uh, even after completing the model like some what not even i could not say finished model but completing in the sense of uh, you know thoda satisfaction like a slight satisfaction that yeah i am getting there so even after doing that i couldn't draw it out so it became so difficult like for me then to you know shift from models which is like a flowy thing because i literally used clay and i could mold it with my hand and i could go on and go on and on and there would be like multiple possibilities and i can never end like i never i still don't know where to stop playing with that clay but when i started drawing i could you know that this is the end of the paper and yeah this is where i should end my drawing or should end my thought process so i mean i don't really like my drawings as much as i like my model i mean so yeah i mean in some sense when i started developing drawings in the way that i could stitch it together i mean if there is a particular like i was thinking of possibilities if there is vegetation and there is a seating and there is something else so if there is one thing that is done then the next possibility but when two possibilities are there together it wouldn't look like it's totally different or some out of context it would merge with each other and create a new whole new landscape and that's how start that's how i started doing and drawing things and for me i still don't have final things with me and that's what i like about my project so yeah yeah i i think that's a very uh, uh, interesting it's very interesting that we are having this discussion where you are talking of 
what you were going through while you were doing it. Uh, because otherwise, normally, even when we talk about process in the final jury or in, uh, when we talk about design, it's one concept sheet or process sheet, which is sort of, which is flattened in time. It's just a diagram which shows steps. Uh, but I think this, this uh, all your descriptions now really make me think about that when, when we are going through that process of designing, how are we engaging with that activity of designing? And uh, um, well, before we go ahead, I would just like to request the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Uh, so meanwhile, that also got me thinking that uh, if I look at the creative aspect of this design process uh, and the critical aspect of this design process, I don't want to put them in opposition because I don't think that they're necessarily in opposition. But sometimes we are in that creative space where we are producing and, and maybe we are producing and then we are making a clay model and we are looking at it and there is an instantaneous reaction and the model sort of molds itself through our hands. But at the same time, uh, Ranjit, uh, you are also pointing out earlier that one also has to be critically aware of the role of the architect and the positions that we uh, sometimes end up taking through the way we design or what we end up designing. So there has to be this critical eye as well. So I, I, I would like all the panelists to uh, maybe touch upon this, that how do you see this, the relationship between when we, when we think critically and when we think creatively and how do they go together rather than seeing it as either do this or, or do that kind of thing. I'll jump in. Yeah, Kashi, I know you like to cook. So, you know, when, when, when I'm cooking, I hate to not be able to taste it from time to time. Huh? And it, uh, even if I have a perfect recipe with, you know, gram to gram connections of everything, then I don't enjoy cooking it. I don't know, it might come out all right, but doesn't really make sense to me. So as I'm making, I want to taste the tomato before I put it in or the chili. I want to taste some spice also. And all the time at every stage, I'm looking at what has happened and I'm uh, changing a decision. This oil has become too hot. I can't do the tadka in this. I'll have to wait or something. So, if something critical is part of this process of creative, I think that is only, I go out, I come back. I go out, I come back. That's what I do um, because I think about my project only. Then, it, then the criticality cannot happen. So I have to think of the world and me and the world and me, world and me like that. And it throbs that way, actually, between critical and creative. And it's, it's part of the same rhythmic process of living. And I think there's nothing, uh, uh, it's very nice, actually, to be at times suddenly become aware, oh, no, now what shall I do? Yeah. Um, and then suddenly you feel, oh, okay, it's all right. I'll somehow manage it, somehow manage it. And that kind of throbbing is something which is part of that whole thing. So I think it's very good, this critical, creative, that uh, rhythmic movement is important. I would like to sort of quickly jump in uh, following that. And uh, it seems to me that sometimes, at least when I was uh, studying in my undergraduate, there was a lot of discussion about um, how uh, when we're studying a body of work of an architect, you sort of instantly observe the language that's been followed by uh, the architect throughout, whereas the process usually sort of, you really have to dig deeper to figure out what the process is. And uh, Professor Charya, when you had mentioned this throbbing between 
being critical and creative where does this flexibility come about for someone uh, does it sort of can you arrive at a similar language by employing re- like multiple processes or are, are these two tied or is there a compulsion to stick to a language and hence sort of uh, keep the process rigid or can one sort of na- that's I, mean, i hope my question is clear but this is something yeah. i wanted you know rahul i think one would have to see the secret sketchbooks <laughs> Yeah. The, the editing that is done by the architect in presenting his thing to the world is something which takes out a whole lot of and it's quite important to see the diaries before or uh, afterwards and you can see that no architect is able to keep to one language and shouldn't i mean after all we are living being uh, and uh, so though it looks like when you when you also it has been written up by somebody else who says you know corbusier did this like this like this like this like this it has been written and taught by a history teacher like me uh, in that manner and actually there are a whole lot of confusions that are there inside that man's work and i think that that's quite quite once you get to know that you feel very good that yeah he also had confusion he also had problems so it's okay i can have so i wouldn't worry too much about it i mean i don't worry but i i, I understand what <laughs> uh, you meant by that uh, and i think i want to also sort of carry this and ask mr anjit if he has an opinion on this uh, and i still want to hold on to this sort of throbbing tendency of a designer or any creative head and how does this come about in a process that's non architectural and how do you identify that uh, thanks for the question i would completely actually agree with professor chaya i mean it's this wonderful uh, metaphor of the throbbing that towards and away that he put into play i think that is how most creative practices work it, but all creative practices i think are to some extent haunted by the phantom of style you know its architecture definitely has that problem uh, the visual arts to a considerable extent in literature to a certain extent because it's it's caught up with notions of a unitary self you know let me kind of pull this back a little i think this comes to us from the enlightenment where we for the first time more or less set ourselves up as sovereign individual selves who as a species were in command of the world and the rest of the world nature was simply going to be resources that we would instrumentalize for our benefit that's the beginning of what's got us anyway right now to this environmental catastrophe we are living through but in terms of the arts i think what has happened is that you know you have notions like style voice in literature which is one of my primary fields for instance there's always this question of so have you found your voice and you want to say i didn't lose it in the shrubbery to go and find it you know nor is it lying there for me to go and pick out you make these things you craft them and you work on them all the time you respond to different kinds of materials and i'm going to quote a uh, major bangla poet called joy goshami who in an interview said uh, he was asked he said well, how is it that none of your books resemble each other he says i can't go on using the same language my language has to be responsive to my subject my preoccupations my deep obsessions at the time whatever i'm reading whatever's happened externally if i have to bear witness it has to be you know that testimony has to be rephrased and you have to learn to make and break what you're doing and i think we are often in every discipline every art there's a great fear of breaking what you've done because you, you feel my goodness i've worked so hard at this this is me this is my style and now what will my audience say what will my clients say what will my readers say they'll be shocked they may be dismayed surprised you have to be true to yourself i seem to have now launched on a kind of bangla track here but you know like tagore said in that incredible poem akla cholore you have to have the conviction to walk by yourself and if you if that allows you then to 
make this new trail and people come to you and they're responsive, then that's great. So in a strange way, it is about seeking your own truth, but it's that truth is not fossilized forever in a single style or a clarity of design or some language that you arrive at and see no reason to change. And I agree with Professor Chaya also, if you look at any great architect, you will, if you attend closely, you'll find often that the ideology and the practice are kind of flying in different directions. There's much more of a responsiveness to the particular occasion. Some things, of course, you might carry some elements along, but even how they're reconfigured in relation to mass, scale, the particular topography, it, if, if, the, if the architect is any kind of visionary, you will find self-rupture and self-breaking. You find the courage to do that. Right, and uh, I would also to ask Ms. Heringo about this. Um, I, from what I've just heard, it seems like it's uh, awfully a big burden to carry because it's a lot to account for. It's a lot to think about. Uh, and when, when it comes to engaging uh, uh, the local and really involving them in this process of designing and building, uh, how do you sort of negotiate your uh, desire, or not, not desire, but your uh, vision of what, what the design should be or the language? And on the other hand, you have the various sort of people that you're working with and also taking in their opinions, taking in their uh, your know, perceptions of what you're trying to do. So from your experience, uh, how has that sort of come about? Did you ask me, Rahul? Yeah, that was, sorry. I'm sorry. so sorry if yes. I didn't yeah, that I, I, did. yeah. <laughs> I was not used to, to say Miss <laughs> Hering. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry. Um, well, it's, it's, some, it's not always comfortable to be my client. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> It's most uncomfortable for my German clients to have me. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm, I'm always pushing the limits. You know, I'm not staying in the comfortable zone. I'm, I'm always pushing the limits. And I, I never just blindly follow, you know, what the clients tell me. I'm not a blank sheet of paper. You know, I'm coming in with my own values and I'm not hiding these values. <laughs> So I had tough discussions already with, with my colleagues sometimes, you know, also in Bangladesh with, with same, you know, no one wants to have a mud house. Of course, no one wants to have one, except, you know, now it becomes super hip fashion in, in, in Europe, but it's super expensive to do it here. But I, in Bangladesh, no one wants it. In, in, in Ghana, also no one wants it. But, you know, I'm, I'm building the same way in Bangladesh as I do in Europe. I only also built here only with local materials. So I'm not making any difference. And I'm saying we're having one planet. And, you know, we have to care for this planet. And I'm, you know, I'm not building with brick for someone in Bangladesh and I'm not building in brick with someone <laughs> in Germany. <laughs> the same ethics. But so I'm challenging, you know, I'm, but I'm, I'm taking the desire very serious that the, the people want to have a house um, there's, they can be super proud of. And, you know, there is this branding when you have a house out of brick and concrete, it's just so much better than a house made out of earth, which is not true, but it's just, you know, this phantom in, 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 in this branding in our mind. And I'm challenging this kind of phantom, you know, and I'm saying, you all, I, I give you the best possible design I'm, I'm able to do. <laughs> I'm sure I'm, 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 I'm make, you know, I give everything that you in the end have a house that you can be proud of. This I'm, I'm really taking serious, but I'm not taking, you know, I'm not just blindly following this wish, you know, not to, you know, to build in brick or to build in, because I think, you know, yes, everyone here is responsible for climate change. Of course, I know that here in Europe, we contribute so much more than a Bangladeshi in Ludapur. This is very clear, but still, you know, I think, we we shouldn't we shouldn't build in brick. It's just you know nowhere, and we shouldn't build in concrete. So I'm having my values. I'm not hiding them, and I'm pushing the limit and I'm pushing out of the comfort zone. And but I'm doing it with lots of empathy and with lots of love. <laughs> and I'm take you know. And this is I think what the clients feel and why they still go with me. This sometimes rocky road and this uncomfortable road.
So, yeah, I mean, speaking of negotiations, there's a question that's come in, I think that fits well here, uh, by from Devolka. Uh, would she like to come live to ask this? Uh, Eve, or should I just sort of read out the question? You can read out the question. We'll right. invite her. Cool, cool. Uh, so uh, the question is, can the panelists give examples where the negotiations between various bodies informed the design process and enriched the output? That's the Volkar's question. I guess I can start if there's no one. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mathur. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, I will not talk about a specific design process, but I'll just talk about the whole process. Should I continue? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The connection is a bit unstable. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, saying that uh, I'll just talk in terms of the whole process. So there were two points in my case where I felt uh, it was about me deciding and me choosing how to go about it exactly. So the first was uh, the program stage wherein um, seeing a spectrum of uh, things that were existing, I had to, you know, exactly decide which factor I'm going to tap in. So, uh, and then the whole scenario of trainings and everything came wherein I felt that the first need was to equip them and get them in a better position. And then we can further see what can be explored after this. So that was the first thing. Second was in terms of architectural language or the design that we talk about uh, was that generally uh, the farmers that are involved in the whole sericulture phase the structures or the spaces that they use is quite of a temporary uh, arrangement that is done using corrugated sheets and temporary materials like that. And purely because of uh, practical reasons, there's not that much finance to actually build nicer spaces. So uh, that was the point wherein I feel, felt that now if I am someone who has the liberty right now that hypothetically that we have the money to build and we have the resources. So uh, why not change the architectural language that has been followed? So basically there was no language in the sericulture uh, process, but then I thought that was the point wherein I will introduce or I might help in that cases uh, to maybe create a better space that was catering to them. So these two were points that I can remember as Right now. Uh, I would I would also like to add about uh, my experience, uh, like that when I was doing uh, the design workshops and everything communication with the communities, and so at that moment I also in, uh, came across various aspects of the uh, or the aspirations of the community. I would say that. When, when I ask certain questions, the answers were completely different. Like the first question, something that I was uh, talking about that if you are relocated or something, which was something different from them, but the points which they gave me, something was at first they wanted to live where the, where the community is also their own. Like if the neighboring settlement is also their own, like see the community, there won't be other community because it would create the conflict with other host community. Then there were certain questions which they uh, told me that that they want certain uh, uh, like connectivity and the development with the nearby uh, with the society and the mainstream society also. So uh, like what we think as an uh, from our point perspective and what they had was something con uh, different. Like when uh, I was talking with the forest department officer, so he had some different aspect that that the the community uh, that they had certain concerns also that if the community is shifted to a new place that there it will uh, prevent the same issue which is uh, right now at the uh, existing location or not so 
during that site selection process so there were certain questions which i also thought that uh, which needs to be thinking beyond what we think about just about uh, designing aspects or development process so that was also that i came across my oh. oh sorry devash go ahead i just wanted to add that uh, for me it was very difficult to uh, whom to negotiate with because it was at a neighborhood level and then how many agencies do you consider and the last agency that i considered was the municipality agency you know like the bmc so because uh, the like we know today that bmc gives so many rules to you know build some build something even if it's a footpath there is a certain width and a uh, height that is given to you and you have to build only in that so you are restricted within that and but like then it doesn't open up the idea of a footpath and because uh, the way we have been seeing how footpaths have been occupying like how they have been occupied since so many years and the sole purpose of how it has been defined is no more the sole purpose and then how do you negotiate with it so and what all agencies do you negotiate with so i mean i was uh, completely shaken up by the idea of whom to negotiate with when it an uh, urban level uh, planning or something yeah yes akshar you were saying something yeah so while you are discussing negotiations this is very peculiar sort of thought that also came to me which can expect what mr hoskot and professor chaya have were also talking about so in one of the my personal processes which i had one sort of faced this wall where this idea of an architectural solution or an architectural interpretation of the problem was something that had really um, struck me because as madhuri also initially mentioned that at some point in a process she couldn't think of an architectural solution directly to an issue and at times which also goes back to what mr ranjit was also saying earlier that the ability to accept that there is sort of a limitation when one is thinking about layers of sort of issues and solutions and this has intrigued me to ask that as in these five years whenever there's a project there's this attempt to bring forth an architectural solution or an architectural sort of interpretation but while the while in the process if there is a point where you feel like there's something else that could do much better to this sort of a program or a context or not a yes or no question but sort of a gradient as well there's there's only 20% need of an architectural intervention over here and something else that does the other 80% of the job how does one even sort of negotiate with that kind of a dilemma and move ahead or not no we have exemplars of that it that's beautifully put uh, akshar really uh, a project that's been very dear to my heart for a long long time is uh, revathi and vasant kamat's uh, anand gram and i also spoke about it sometime last year to a sept group uh, I had occasion to revisit it for all kinds of reasons but that's a project like that is where you have an incredible process where the architect just sits down and engages with the community which is in fact the client you know so there are some state agencies involved indeed but the architect knows that it's the community that's being resettled that's the real client goes into their life world and really embarks on a collaborative process of translation of the life world of this community of magicians and artisans of all kinds and it's not some hokey thing that's up in mid air it's completely robust artisanal real achieved and it nor is it romantic in terms of how do we save this rural existence in the middle of a city the, the solutions were architectural but they didn't come out of an architecture course they came out of a training in in the public sphere in translation speaking across languages in embracing the life world of the other so there were other kinds of learnings just that they didn't happen to be textbook architecture so and the result was not something other than architecture it was architecture but it was an expanded practice
you know the the uh, importance given to um, sarkari norms yeah, is something which fortunately we are in a country in which uh, it is possible to interpret in different ways there's a very famous architect i won't tell you his name when he designed his house, he had a mezzanine, which was only seven feet high, which he wanted to sleep in, or he wanted his children to sleep in, actually. And so he went to the, the plans were put in, and the municipal engineer who respected this man called him in and said, this plan cannot be passed. He said, why? Because you said it's a bedroom. It's a habitable room, and habitable rooms cannot be less than nine feet in height. So we can't pass, pass this plan. So he said, okay, but uh, suppose uh, I say it's a store. Then, no, if it's a store, then it's okay. Then uh, if I put uh, some books in that room, is it all right? He said, yeah, that's fine. You can store anything there. So once the books are there, suppose I sit down there and I read a book. Is that accepted? So um, of course it's in your store. You can do but then suppose I fall asleep there. The man said, please go away and go, just write store. That's all. And so um, the, the uh, official documents, they can't think about everything. It's often necessary to talk at great length to people who are in cause so that they take into account and then use their powers to, to broaden the definitions that are there. So after all, the laws are for written for us, by us, and not by somebody else, and we have to follow it. I mean, it should, that should be our attitude to it. So I think then, then negotiation is possible. It's, a, it's not even negotiation, it's a kind of, because this negotiation term also, it comes from some, you know, really, uh, sleazy kind of environments. And I like to think about it as conversations, discussions, and then you know, we, we agree, we agree. Chalo. Ah, that we, we have to come to that kind of, yeah. But in school, you're right. The school which doesn't allow that has to be questioned. The school which doesn't allow the non-architectural solution has to be questioned. And I think that is that is really important. If anything that goes out from this forum, if we can send out a message to, to the school that you won't be only looking at architecture and solutions, I think that's a good thing that happens. So we have another question that come in. Um, he or Akhid should be sort of bring them on to the call. No, you, you can okay, just okay. read the question. Yeah, okay. So, uh, architecture as a means of making cannot be evaluated only with proof, but also by the interpretation and articulation of one's preferences and rituals. My question is to do with the rituals of the new age and how they affect students and their approach towards their work. So, that's the statement. The question is that. Architectural schools stress on habits, customs, and architectural canon whose value might grow obsolete from their original intentions. Um, sorry, just lost question. Yeah, uh, how do schools navigate new media tools, not only as technique, but also as conceptual devices? That's the question. I think the school is the place where these things are constantly tried out. And uh, out of that emerges something. It's also tried out in the practice. I mean, it should be. Every new method, new kind of way of, of living in the world, every technology or every technique, every uh, form of customary uh, relationship, all of those should affect both practice and the school. 
and the school should be regularly looking at the the ways in which the new practices the new forms can be integrated into their way of thinking and how we will need to give up some of the older ones so i th think that is something which is uh, not something that you can say theoretically about it but it is something that has to continuously happen so i think that question is a good one but we can't give an answer like that it's something that you play it out day by day in in your practice in your school also i think that uh, a lot of times uh, in such institutions we forget that that the institution is not only a place where the students learn but it's also the place where the teachers learn how to teach and when that doesn't happen i think uh, the problem that uh, i think subin you are talking of that is when institutions face this problem is the only way i can put it yes so uh, i think we are rahul what should we do yeah. there is another question i think do we have okay. the time to take another one uh, if everyone one one more okay maybe the last one so yeah, okay, just, just the last one okay. yeah okay i'll just read this out uh, most often it is observed while presenting the design solutions the influences and inferences are drawn from the external factors or context while the decision making involves a lot of conscious or subconscious intuitive inferences there's no room for personal challenges struggles or influences in architecture so the question in the case of poetry or art it is left to the viewers or readers to understand these inferences from the body of work towards the person but is there a possibility in architecture for personal influences very consciously becoming an integral part of the design process uh this question was asked by bhakti if uh she can be let into the call please add right what ranjit said about the ethical uh, base so ethic background to anything that you do means that you are Uh, while you are a completely free individual you are also responsible to everything that is on on earth sorry in the universe even uh, including all forms of life and non living and so on but also other human beings and i think that it will be something which uh, uh requires you to take into account more than your self when you are even the poet i don't think there is a common in that the author or the poet can write something you know kisi ke arwan mat karo you know if people want to read they will read i will write it's it's not really like that i and ranjit could tell us something about that i completely agree i think in every art i mean if you trap yourself in some kind of narcissistic self indulgence then that's not art really because art art assumes an audience otherwise we can all we're all you know we sing in the shower but some of us are truly musicians now how does that happen likewise in each case in in, in every art so uh, i i would also extend uh, what you just said professor chai and to engage with the question uh, to me the question really raised the problem of who is who is the audience for for architecture who is the audience for an architect's work and uh, it's a very brief example i've often heard it said of delhi that oh it's all sarkari architecture or oh, it's all nehruvian architecture i've always been amazed by that idea it's not true i it was at one point a playground and a laboratory for architecture you can walk around delhi uh, still at least for the next few years i hope and point out how just how many architects were at work there you know, joseph allen stein shivnat prasad uh, raj rewal uh, name it you know devlalikar apart of course from lotians and baker i can think of so many architects was, but the trouble in public perception is that it all flattens out 
And I've, I've always been saddened by that. It's somehow, whilst the other arts seem to have some way of reaching out to a public, architecture as an art only seems to reach out to those who care for it, for practitioners or those like me who are fellow travelers of it. How does it reach out to some great public? I don't know. And I think that's, you know, when you look back at key moments in the history of architecture, you'll find that architects found ways of reaching out to their public. Whether it was the Nordic masters, whether it was the Bauhaus people, they found ways exhibiting their work, putting out manifestos, uh, little magazines, appearing in the public media. You know, you can't retreat from that because then we'll have the sad case of a flattening of people just not understanding that there is a rich diversity of architectural practices. You know, how do you, how do you bridge this gap to the public? And to a point where a, well, a reasonably well-informed public can say, yes, I've been following the work of this architect. I can see these continuities uh, or the ruptures as the case may be. How do you build this larger, reasonably informed audience for architecture? That to me is the takeaway from Bhakti's question. Also one of the takeaways. Yeah, I think that that is very interesting. And uh, I was just thinking that if we were doing this on campus, you would have broken into a lot of smaller groups and the discussions would have sort of lingered on over the cup of chai at the canteen. Uh, but I think uh, I think it's, it's, we have sort of opened up a lot of, lot of uh, points for discussion and I hope it stays with all of us and we continue this, this process of thinking about it. Uh, Yes, I, I now hand it over to Heer to sort of conclude this session. Thank you, Fashi. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It indeed was an immensely fascinating and compelling discussion. It has forced us all to step back and put on our thinking hats. These conversations and thoughts are definitely going to stay with us. I would also like to thank everyone on behalf of the KVDF team for joining us today on Zoom as well as YouTube. Do join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. IST for an engaging detox between Rahul Mehrotra and Ilze Wolf. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.